Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Hey, I'm so glad you've joined us on Life Support. We're looking forward to telling stories that will encourage you, that will remind you that Jesus is real. Jesus can help you. He can lean into your issues and give you new life. And I have two guests with me that have um, talked to me about this. They were here a week ago. Uh, they have incredible stories about how God has reached in and touched them. It's Chad and Tiffany Newharth, and they run an organization called Rise Up Recovery. We're going to talk about that as well, but thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you both. Thank you for, for sharing your stories with us. Um, last time you, you both talked about these um, these. Um, journeys of addiction and being in bondage and hopelessness and and some of the um, consequences that were that came along with that. But then you also shared about how God reached in and with cries for help answered those cries for help. And uh, Chad, I'll start with you. Um, tell me a little bit about um, after you cried out to God for help, and it was a very the way you both described it. Your prayers were raw. They were. They were desperate. Um, how did your life change after that moment? Well, I would say it changed in every way. <laughs> it changed in every single possible way. And again, the biggest thing from that moment, because there was there was there was a lot of um, mountaintop faith moments that would come after that. Um, you know, all the way my baptism and and um, some different moments where I maybe accepted Christ in a different way as I had more knowledge, right? Um, at that time, I, I didn't know anything. It was just raw. I was just calling out to, to God. But I, but that being said, everything was different from that point on. Um, I had this, this, not only was that guilt and shame lifted, but I had this curiosity that I couldn't mm. contain. It was mm -hmm. unsatiable at times. You had a thirst. A thirst, yes. Yep. And now... Uh, have you gone, haven't gone through that. Now you're teaching at the school that you went back to and got your degrees. Sure, yeah. And that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. Who would have thought? <laughs> Not me. Only God can do those things. Yeah. Absolutely. And Tiffany, for you, you were able to um, get your counseling license back mm -hmm. um, through Teen Challenge. And, and what kind of people are you working with right now? So we work with, again, some of the most desperate people, people who are lost and bound in addiction, um, wrought with mental health issues, uh, many homeless, some coming out of incarceration. Um, yeah, coming from similar backgrounds as Chad and I, I would say. So not exactly the, um, the, the upper crust rich um, person who can hand you um, big checks. And uh, these are people that a lot of people would just cast off to the side, right? Absolutely. Although some of them may have been very rich yeah. at some point in time mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and lost, lost everything. everything. Yeah. Yes. That's so um, we hear a lot, Tiffany, about um, these different drugs that are, are threatening now. Um, you know, my kids are always talking about things at high school that they're trying to learn. You've spoken here um, to our kids at church about some of these dangers. What are the what are the new drugs, the new danger zones right now for for students and for others that are that might struggle with this mm -hmm. that's an interesting question because honestly there's a lot i think it, it's so different now than when i was back in school from something that seems benign like vaping for example i think that's a pretty significant issue uh, to even now just the the legalization of recreation marijuana use i think that the perspective that our culture has on substance use as kind of an immediate fix and solution for our discomfort and our stresses and pain and all that, I think, is kind of at the baseline of some of these more immediate scary issues like fentanyl. You know, and fentanyl is a substance that it's a synthetic opiate that is 50 times stronger than heroin. So it takes just a minute amount to cause overdoses. And we are seeing people die at unprecedented levels. I mean, on average, it's 211 people per day who die from fentanyl poisoning. 
or from opiate overdose in general. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the equivalent of that is a commercial size airplane crashing every single day. And it's not talked about. Nobody, not nobody's talking about that. Yep, they're not talking about it because, again, it's that perspective of, well, it's just those people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not Until it's your kid. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it is. It's our yeah. kids. It's our our doctors, our pharmacists, our, you know, your neighbors, that people are suffering in silence from this. And it's a, it's a very scary thing. But I think it's such a complex issue because really at the root of it, you know, what is the messaging that we're sending? You know, I'm a... I'm a I love Hallmark movies, okay, <laughs> around the holidays and the last couple so years. So I'm guessing that um, Chad is a really good husband. <laughs> right. And no. we'll sit there and pretend he's, a, he's, <laughs> he's seeing a new plot line when it's really the same plot line. That's over and been over. in every movie for the last three years. But anyway, go exactly. ahead. Exactly. Yes. But my point with that, there's something comforting about predictability, right? Yeah, there really is. <laughs> but every single Hallmark movie that I've watched had drinking in it. Every single one. I'm like, what's wrong with this? This is a messaging thing that we're sending of normalizing this that I think has led us in some ways to the to the place that we are. Well, when you mentioned um, the legalization of, of recreational uh, marijuana, we're in Minnesota right now mm -hmm. uh, recording this, and this just happened in our state within the last month. So it's brand new. And um, I was on a panel here in um, the city that, that I passed her in, and one of the de the detectives that was on this panel, and we were talking about this very issue, and uh, he just looked right at the audience and said, you know, in my opinion, marijuana is a gateway drug. They said there's no way around it. And so I'm thinking to myself, as these people are all patting themselves on the back after passing this law, like, wh what experts have you been talking to? Because everyone I talk to, every study I read, Marijuana leads to mental health issues, especially in kids. Um, but but what can we do about this? Because my kids are now growing up in a culture where it's going to be okay for adults. Now they say 21, okay, mm -hmm. great. But if this, I mean, obviously the door's open now. Mm -hmm. So w what is a parent to do mm -hmm. with this? Talk to your kids openly and honestly and regularly. You know, I think there's a misconception that if we openly talk about this, it's almost going to give curiosity or um, open the door more for them. But on the contrary, the more they're educated and armed and aware, and especially hearing s testimonies like ours of, look, guys, I started using when I was in middle school, yeah. high school, right? And that completely changed the, my brain development, my emotional development. They need to hear this, you know, from real live raw perspectives, but parents having those open dialogues with their kids, remaining curious, um, we check our kids' rooms and, you know. Yeah, don't be afraid to do <laughs> you that, You don't get right? privacy in our house. Yeah. You don't, you check know. Check their phones, check their rooms. Exactly. Find out who their friends are. Yeah, I think the open, honest, raw, vulnerable communication is absolutely key. Educating them on all sides and and then being there to love them and support them if they choose to make those decisions that aren't healthy. Right, because mm -hmm. we all do sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, Chad, when you... Um, when you're teaching, you're, you're involved. You're with a lot of um, of young young adults and stuff. Like, do you do you pick up uh, these issues with? The, do you sense this around you that there's this growing desire for these kinds of experiences amongst them, or what kind of vibe do you get from them as you're in school teaching and so forth? So I teach IT classes. Yeah. Um, and. Um, as an adjunct teacher, right? So I, I'm, I have a, I'm a career in the IT world right. uh, during the day, and I teach them evening classes. Uh, so most of the kids, I would say I teach some kids and some adults because it's, you know, uh, two-year technical college. Right. But most of the kids that come through are, are kids that want to be there and they're, you know, um, care about their future. That being said... I see addiction issues, and typically those issues are more along the lines of video game addictions, to be quite honest. Interesting. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and you can tell, like, like the, it's, you can spot them a mile away, mostly because that's what they talk about in, when they're before class and after class and sometimes during class. Um, and they struggle. And they struggle and they struggle, and a lot of them actually end up quitting. So, yeah, it's just another addiction issue. Because they issue. just can't get off it. It's just another addiction issue that takes over, yep. So as a parent... Um, when I when I see my high school boys, um, I'm trying to lean into their lives as much as I can. 
um, but I'm not with them 24-7. They have friends. Um, they're at other people's homes. Um, they kind of have to have a phone or I can't talk to them. And, and, and here's the really interesting thing, too, is they have to have phones to do school. Yeah. Like, they, like it would be easy to say, well, you can't bring your phone to school. Well, then they're not in touch with their teachers, and when they get a schedule change, they don't know about it, things like that. So as a parent, I feel really helpless. Yeah. W- what does a parent do? Like, how do we, I know we talk to them, but what about this whole electronic thing you just brought up? Because this is a different mm-hmm. animal, right? Yeah. How do we get control over this, or can we? Yeah, it's a tough one. We've yeah. got a we've got a, a 13 year old son at home, and oh, so you're living it too. Yeah, yeah, we're living it, and and you can't take their phone away because then you lose out on life 360. So you can't track them, right? That's like, exactly. Yeah, we've got that, and it's <laughs> popping up all the time. Yeah, yeah, and I've gotten so used to that, I can't be without it, and, yeah. and you know, I have to. Um, yeah, it's weird. It never was. We never had that before, and it was fine. But now I just <laughs> right, need right, to know yeah. where he is, and right. But yeah, it's it, it is really hard. And the biggest thing is is that we just reserve the right to grab that phone anytime we mm-hmm. want and go through it. And um, and we've certainly had some mixed experiences in doing that, and had some had to have some difficult conversations. But isn't isn't that you know it's just there's nothing new under the sun, right? It's, there is there, not. The, it's the diff- human heart is still the human heart. Yeah, right? and and yep. and there's going to be all that stuff. The world is still the world. Yeah. You know, so. And I think for as a parent, you know, just be ready to see. If you do grab your kid's phone, if you do um, do some checking around, you know, they're going to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't expect them to be, you know, perfect Christians. Um, they're not. You're going to find stuff you don't like. You're going to find shocking stuff at times. But what a great opportunity to talk to them, right? right? I mean, and not to freak out. Like, I would just advise any parent, and I'm no expert. You guys are the experts. But I would just say, um, if you're going to go grab your kid's phone, just spend a little bit of time praying, mm-hmm. stealing yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, think about what your reaction is going to be so you don't, like, fly off the wall. And, th- and you s- use it as an opportunity to talk to your kid. You know, give them whatever discipline is proper, but do it in a way that's not angry, that's helpful. Um, and I think sometimes what we forget as Christian parents is our kids have the sin problem. Yes. Just like we do. Just like us. And, and we, we expect them to somehow avoid <laughs> sin you know like like we did somehow and um you know i think there's there's some realism there the thing that scares me tiffany about what you said though is is the 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 whole uh, fentanyl issue um that's frightening to me because um when when my kids have been in middle school and so forth they've they've told stories of kids trying to shove drugs at them and and so forth and they've thankfully said no i think although i don't know 100 percent but that's a frightening thing when such a little bit can do so much damage. Why, why isn't anybody talking about this? That's a really good question. I don't know. We Is it talk about it as much as possible, I think. I, yeah, You know, right. I think in some ways um, we don't necessarily have a solution for it, right? Well, we know what the solution is. The solution is Christ. Um But it's, it feels like this absolute insurmountable problem that we're facing and you know I think that it does need to be talked about more I think with our kids in our homes and that's where it starts I don't think we can expect it to come from the top down I don't think that's going to happen not anytime soon anyways Mm -hmm. so you know I know kids we're from Dakota County and Dakota County Drug Task Force will tell you every single drug that they've seized every single pill has been a counterfeit pill meaning that it's made on the streets with pill presses and they all have fentanyl in them. So our kids, when they go online and different social media sites like Snapchat and uh, the unfortunate thing is they're being preyed upon now too. Yeah. You know, so they, you have these drug dealers that are reaching out and, um, and pursuing them and they think they might be getting a, a pain medication for their toothache that they have that's benign and it's not. So Mm -hmm. having those really important conversations, again, I come back to that. You said something really important about prayer. I think that that's so significant, you know, praying for our families, praying for our kids, Mm -hmm. um, praying that covering over them, and and that they will make choices that, you know, even when they do make some riskier choices, which is inevitable, right, that sin problem, that those choices won't result in death. Yeah. Um, 
And, you know, to say something shocking on a Christian radio station, um, this really isn't a political issue. There are political aspects to it, Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, like how it gets here and so forth. But, you know, this isn't uh, President Biden's fault. This isn't uh, Governor of Minnesota Tim Walz's fault. This isn't, you know, we as parents have to take the responsibility Mm -hmm. because these kids are our kids. And someday when I'm standing before Christ, I'm going to be answering for my family. He's not going to go over to Tim Walls and say, why didn't you take care of Paul's family? Right. He's going to look at me and say, did you shepherd your wife? Did you shepherd your kids? All that to say, I don't want to inflict shame at all because we're all imperfect. We're all overwhelmed. We're all tired. We're all busy. But at the end of the day, y- you as a parent have more influence over your kids than you think you do. Mm-hmm. They will follow you more than they're going to follow their teachers or their friends if you are one that just cares about them and is setting that kind of an example. Mm-hmm. And I think that parents sometimes underestimate the influence that they have. And you mentioned it, Chad, when you said, you know, I didn't have a dad. That's the first thing that came out of your mouth when you, mm-hmm. when you did your testimony. Yeah. So that was a big deal, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, the biggest. Yeah, and then when you saw it, your kids for the first time, it all came back mm-hmm. and sent you into a, a deep dive. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, a little personal question, but how now do you reckon, how, how have you been able to, to um, reconcile what happened to you and you, your new dad. I'm not talking about necessarily the relationship with him, but mm-hmm. and um, your kids. You know, how have you been able to kind of patch all that together in your mind and, and, yeah, and move forward? That's a big, hard question. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably still. It's probably it's, it's still a work under, in progress. Yeah, yeah right. it's a work in progress. It's it's the, terrifying at first, right? It's like, well, I don't I don't have anything to draw on to mm-hmm. to draw from. I, I don't have an example. I don't have a, even a bad example. I just have no example. Uh, so I don't know what it looks like to be a dad. And um, so, that, so that part is hard. And then I've got the part where I missed a significant portion of their developmental years. Um, and all of a sudden they're teenagers and I've got full custody and now I have to give them some tough love. But yet I haven't established those years of just showing them unconditional love. Right, right. right. And so wrestling with that so so maybe it's a unique story maybe it's not unique for some maybe there's lots of other people going through it um i think the the only advice i can possibly give because it is still just a work is is what to agree with tiffany it's it's about prayer and then to agree with you it's about that that heart posture of they too just like me are sinners in need of a savior right Mm -hmm. just like me and and to kind of parent from that that uh, that posture and that that place right and, and they're they're loved by God unconditionally and so yeah. we've got to figure out a way to do that but not look past all their stuff they're doing so yeah. so Tiffany you guys um, do this thing called Rise Up Recovery mm-hmm. um, tell me about that and and how your stories fit into what you're trying to accomplish there yeah I think our our stories are interwoven every single day into that that we get to use our lived experience to really come alongside people who are uh, just as broken as we were and are even and uh, walk alongside them and continue to point them to Jesus. You know, because even that, we're not the Redeemer, but He is. And so really modeling lives of redemption and continuing to point to Christ in all that we do and, and then let Him do the heavy lifting. You know, that's really kind of what it's about. We, you know, we do, we offer some specific services, like we have recovery housing. We've got a men's house and a women's house that people can come to. So it's just creating safe space for them to explore and to be loved and to heal, really. It's actually a really big deal. And you kind of undersold that. And I was going to ask you about that because (laughs) when you came in today, you said, hey, we have this new house. Mm Mm-hmm. And so you, it's obviously the ministry is expanding and, and yes. moving forward, right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Our prayer from the beginning was, Lord, on, on, you say in your word, unless the Lord builds the house, they who labor, labor in vain. And so this is really his ministry. Um, I think Chad and I both live from the perspective of our lives are not our own. Um, the minute he saved me, I just knew, Lord, I'm yours. Do with me what you will. And so this ministry is the same thing. And um, yeah, it's been over two years now which is not long at all. And we went from me meeting with one or two people in a coffee shop to uh, having a community center that was completely donated, a women's house, and now a men's house, and serving hundreds of people wow. every year. Wow. You know, and so it's, it's quite incredible to 
just watch him. The other really cool thing I would say is that the majority of our staff are people with lived experience with recovery. And uh, Rise Up Recovery, I think, is a safe haven for them too, to kind of come into their own, to grow in their faith. Uh, and their giftings and their skills. You have to give back like you're able to. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's we're at the place now where we just kind of seek the Lord and His vision and and create space and support everybody else as they continue to yeah. do the work, <laughs> right, which right. is really neat. Well, you're you're both very impressive people, and your testimony is is amazing. So, uh, tell me how we can get a hold of more information about what you're doing. Yeah, t- check out our website. Uh, www.riseuprecoverymn.com. There's all kinds of information on there. You can see our different programs, opportunities to give, volunteer. Uh, that would be the best place. Check out our website. And I would add sign up for the, for the mailing list. So Tiffany does a really good job of sending out a, an update. It's just, I mean, it's just the stories just keep coming. It's just every every month is just holy buckets. Yeah. So it's it's pretty. People have a lot of fun following along. So you don't have to feel like you're you're going to be uh, um, sought after to donate. Just get online, find yeah. out more information, pray, mm-hmm. get on the mailing list, become part of the community. Yes, and I. My invitation for everyone would be to join our prayer newsletter in particular because we are always looking for prayer partners. We believe wholeheartedly in the power of prayer. And so if you would join us in praying, not only for Rise Up, but for for individuals struggling with substance use disorder and mental health, please. Yeah. And and to pray for both of you. Yes. Because you're both, um, you know, you're targets of the enemy. And, uh, you know, my wife and I are both in ministry and and it's... uh, I always tell people, like, don't ever come to my house on Saturdays. Um, it, it, it's not a pretty sight. Um, Satan's, uh, he's got, I don't know, if he just calls up every demon and says, go to Paul's house on Saturdays. But I think that's probably how it works. And they have some kind of a group chat or something. <laughs> but I just know that there's a lot of spiritual warfare out there. So we want to pray for both of you as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much for dropping by. It's really great to meet both of you.